If you're finding that when you interact with food that it doesn't give you energy, then that's a problem with how you're interacting with food. That's not a problem with food. So there's either a problem with the quality of the food that you're putting in your body, or there's there's a problem with the area that has to interact with that food, which is most likely your gastrointestinal lining. Okay, and so your gastrointestinal lining is not able to assimilate the singular molecules and minerals and micronutrients that you need to enable you to 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 help with like metabolic and enzymatic processes and chemical reactions in the body. Listen, Stokely, where we try to be involved, to listen and learn for us all to evolve. So welcome to you and welcome the world. We hope you enjoy the stories to be told. Stokely is a creative endeavour to listen, learn and evolve through the art of conversation. And here's your host, Noel. Hi everyone, how you doing? Welcome back to another episode of Stokely. Thanks a lot for joining us. Today, I have the real privilege of speaking to Dave O'Brien, co-founder of Fifth Element Wellness in Melbourne. Dave has a wealth of knowledge and it's pretty incredible to listen to him speak, listen to the passion that comes out of his mouth and also the extensive knowledge that just blows my mind when I listen to him sometimes on a rant. And when I say rant, I mean that with very good meaning because Dave is 100% passionate about what he does and the people he helps. So Dave's methodologies are really disruptive and confronting at first, but his ability to relate and educate and also empower people around him is what makes him a really compassionate leader in the community of health and wellness and also the community that him and his team have been able to create at Fifth Element Wellness. Can't give anything away mainly because I, I don't really know how to explain most of the terms that Dave touches on in this conversation but I really hope you enjoy it and before we get into it I do want to thank the traditional custodians upon the lands which we gather here in listening to the podcast and also creating the podcast and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to invite you to join me in paying respects to the beings everywhere that keep the law of the land. So thanks a lot for joining us here. And if you do have anything that you'd like to share with us, please reach out to us at Stokely Podcast. And uh, yeah, share the episode with someone that you know, and I hope it sparks a conversation in your life. Uh, sit down, take this all in. Dave's got a lot to share. Yeah, it might be a, it might be a hard one to follow along with sometimes because we get into some pretty big depth of, of knowledge and as I said, Dave's knowledge is extensive, but uh, yeah, enjoy. It's a good one. Thanks a lot. Hey, Dave. Hey, Joel. How you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. It's been an uh, interesting uh, <laughs> 2020, that's for sure, mate. It's, uh, it's been a roller coaster. But, you know, uh, outside of that, it's, uh, you know, I've been helping lots of people, doing what I'm passionate about, um, you know, it's probably even more gangbusters than it was before. There's more and more people reaching out to, to want to improve their health. And I think maybe the coronavirus has sort of held up the mirror to a lot of people in terms of uh, where they might be uh, missing sort of, sort of certain aspects within their lifestyle and so forth. So That's so interesting, hey? People keep saying, oh, I've got a lot more time now. Well, everyone's got the same amount of time, but do you think people's maybe priorities are shifting or like what what's been the overall reasoning behind why you think people are uh, acting differently during this time i think there's a whole array of different uh issues is that is that clear all right or do you want me to hey, it's, it's, i mean you look good mate you look good so <laughs> don't worry about it <laughs> Yeah, that's all right. You almost look like um, a little bit of a. I've always you. You've always been this kind of like um, strong Greek man, this Greek god. You know, like one of those. Whenever you walk in the Fifth Element, you're just like, "There's Dave. He's the he's the god looking guy over there." Um, you know, and not to I say that, know, mate. Like <laughs> some 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 people might think it's a little bit of like a homeless look going on, mate. Like. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the beard and the and the curly messy hair so like a you know maybe it's uh maybe it's uh shifting in between that sort of uh 
Greek god, but sometimes like a bit of a homeless look as well. <laughs> so, oh, mate, you've um, got to you've got to be humble in in your in the in the ways that you go about things. So I guess it's probably a good balance. <laughs> it's a good way of looking at it, mate. Um, <laughs> but I just yeah, I just think I just think it's interesting the the the, the whole coronavirus in terms of um, you know I think for some people it's it's definitely made them take stock of what's really important. Um, and I think you know for for those people who were you know, working extremely long days and uh, you sort of get stuck in the hamster wheel, don't you? Yeah, okay. And when you're stuck stuck in the hamster wheel, wheel you, you never have time to sort of like pull back and, and really analyse what like what direction you really want to go and what's really important to you, okay? And then, and then when all of a sudden the handbrake gets put on and no longer you sort of spinning around in that hamster wheel, all of a sudden you, you've got more time to spend with your family. You've got more uh, time to to maybe even sit back and analyze what, what you really want to do. Like, what are you really passionate about? What's your, what's your real purpose? Yeah. Okay. And I think there's a, the, uh, Magio, there's definitely a whole heap of people who've sort of, sort of slotted into that sort of aspect in terms of they've had time. Now they've had time to really assess things. Um, and that's probably caused them to want to not go back to what they were doing before. Uh, and they don't, and they don't want to be in the hamster wheel anymore, and they really want to. They've, they've got time to to um, you know follow their passion a lot more. So I think there's 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 definitely that group, okay. Um, and then like I, I think there's a lot of good that is going to come out of the coronavirus. Yes, there's there's a lot of things that are impacting us financially, and 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 you know probably from a psychological aspect and mental health uh, aspects and. Uh, you know, I, I think obviously, you know, they're, they're some of the negative aspects. But I think, you know, even for myself, like, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a blessing as well, okay, because I've actually had time to sit back and and uh, and, and really figure out how I, I, I can better help people as well. Um, and so without that time, uh, you, you, you don't really have time to explore that side of things, okay? Um, so, you know, I, I just think there's, there's, there's different, uh, you know, different pros and, 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 and potentially different cons. Yeah. Okay. Like the one thing I probably noticed for myself is that, um, it sort of took me out of my routine. Uh, and so a lot of things that I, you know, uh, generally just really stringent with and just they're part of my, my, my daily routine, they started to sort of waver. Um, that would be things like meditation. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I can, I can put my hand up and say that, um, that hasn't, that hasn't been great for me over this period of time. Yeah. Um, so meditation, ice therapy, um, you know, diaphragmatic breathing, all these things that, you know, if I'm honest, like I, I do them regularly, I do them weekly, I do them daily. Okay. Um, and they've actually been pretty poor over this, uh, this coronavirus, um, you know, um, time frame. Yeah. Okay. And I just think there's, for me, there's uh, probably that a big community aspect. And that's the one thing that I would say is, is really missing. Um, so yes, we've had time to spend with family. Yes. We've had time to, to pull back and analyze what's really important. And yes. We've had time to maybe, you know, do uh, research and study and all these types of things, but also, you know, we've gone uh, further away from community um and then there, there, there will be some detrimental harm that comes out of that and you know i probably just realize major like how important that is for me to actually uh allow me to maintain structure does that make sense yeah definitely um i think um mate this knowing you somewhat and and having seen you and your team at fifth fifth element work over the last kind of five years this there's so much I can take out of just just what you've said there. Um, I'd love to I'd love to first go towards the um, what you've got to say about um, longevity in the blue zones. Now I know you you and a couple of other guys have gone on a couple of um, so like blue zone retreats um, to Sardinia, and I'm not sure if you did you end up going to Japan as well into Osaka. Or? No, we look we we were definitely uh, planning to go to Okinawa. Um, okay, and yeah. obviously it's a it's a particular part of Okinawa. I mean, that's 
one thing to probably uh, get across is that, you know, within these uh, particular blue zones, that it's actually particular uh, places within the blue zone that are actually classified as the blue zone region. So we went to Sardinia and obviously one of my, you know, one of my colleagues and, um, you know, really good friends, Guy Lawrence. Uh, so we went to Sardinia. We took a small group of, uh, you know, about 15 people, um, you know, and we obviously just wanted to experience, uh, I guess, the community aspect and the lifestyle aspects of, uh, I guess, what these uh, uh, communities are doing in these blue zone areas. So we didn't end up... Uh, unfortunately making it to Okinawa I mean you know with everything that's happened more recently um, a lot of those things have been you know uh, sort of postponed and and halted and uh, hopefully it's it's things that we can do uh, again soon because we 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 definitely want to continue with that and go to Ikaria in Greece and uh, there's Nokoya in Costa Rica and obviously there's the seventh day Adventist which is you know, a small pocket in the, in California. Mm. Um, and it, like, yeah, so, you know, I've, I've, I've done a lot of research on blue zone areas and you know, especially with what types of foods they consume. And I think that's where, uh, unfortunately, there's, there's a lot of focus that has been put on like, okay, so what foods are they eating? And we need to eat more towards that. Um, and I, it's actually not the, the, the key aspects that all the blue zone areas really have in common. Okay, because you actually look at a lot of those uh, blue zone areas, they generally do eat uh, uh, different types of foods. Okay, um, so the one thing I always talk about that the blue zone areas really have in common is community. Okay, that's what they really have in common, and this uh, this allows them because they're they, you know they're not always in that sort of fight fight and flight response, and you know stimulating a lot of like catecholamines and stress hormones and things like cortisol. They, 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 they tend to keep in balance, um, you know, real key uh, ratios in the body. And one of those key ratios is the cortisol to DHEA ratio. And, and, and they're like, you know, for, for your listeners who don't really understand, you know, cortisol is obviously, you know, the stress hormone. And I don't want to demonize it because, you know, cortisol is a good thing. It stimulates your lymphatic organs. So it actually helps with stimulation of white blood cells, immune system. So anti-inflammatory. So there's... You know, cortisol is not the devil. Most of the time, it's just when you're either, you know, you're producing too much or even when your body can't produce enough, okay, because then you're immunosuppressed. Um, but, you know, DHEA, uh, which is like an androgen hormone, it's like your anti-aging hormones, your longe- longevity hormone, okay? And believe it or not, DHEA is like, it's a precursor to 50 other hormones, okay, including things like melatonin. Okay, and actually DHEA in your adrenal cortex, so in your adrenal glands, that is actually the major steroidal hormone that you should produce from the adrenal glands, not cortisol. Okay, and so you think about in these blue zone areas where they've got, you know, uh, less allostatic load, so their stress load is a lot less, okay, where they don't have a lot of psychological stress, physiological stresses, you know, uh, herbicides and pesticides and, you know, not overstimulation of their immune system where their immune system is causing damage, you know, especially to areas like the gastrointestinal lining, you know, bacterial byproducts and all these things that adds to that allostatic load. And because their allostatic load is not as severe as what we would, ha- uh, what we would be experiencing in, uh, you know, more Western countries and Western society, okay, that actually helps where they're producing higher amounts of the DHEA and lower amounts of the cortisol, which means that DHA, D, D, DHEA cortisol ratio is just a lot, uh, a lot, a lot better. Yeah, okay, and that's obviously going to hold them in uh, better stead for for things like longevity and and you know you know getting to ninety and hundred without uh, you know needing you know medications and uh, you know they have uh, far less instances of you know autoimmune conditions and cancer and like. One of the fundamental aspects that I, I definitely know they have in common, okay, is that you know they they do they just have a lot more community. They eat together, okay, and the biochemical effects of when you do things in community are just amplified, okay. So all the nourishment that you're getting from the food, and then you do that in a community setting, well, you can just multiply that by by quite a fair bit, okay, when you're doing that in a community setting. 
Um, so, and that's, they're just doing that in abundance. Yeah. Okay. And even like, uh, you know, one key aspect also, you know, even with the elders, okay, is that a lot of their elderly, um, they, they still work the land. So they still have purpose. Um, and so they're still doing that into their eighties. Okay. They're still working the land. Yeah. Okay. They're still active. They're moving. Okay. You know, they're not doing things like Olympic weightlifting and powerlifting and, you know, they're just, they're just moving frequently. Okay. So that's helping with blood flow and circulation and things like nitric oxide. And, okay? and that helps with aspects of like even the stomach lining and all these, all these types of aspects. So they're just, they're just doing that uh, frequently. Yeah. Okay. And, and also the elders, yeah. Okay. They're not, you know, they're not put in like an elderly home. Okay. They're spending a lot of time amongst the, the, the younger generation. They're passing on their knowledge. Okay. And if there's one thing that is going to, um, keep the elderly okay young it's going to be being around uh, the younger population the younger younger generation okay and so in western society you know when when people get older now we put them in uh, nursing homes we put them in elderly homes where they're surrounded by more you know uh other older people yeah okay and then uh, essentially that would just speed up the aging process okay um and so yes i could sit there and focus on you know, in Sardinia, okay, they, you know, they eat things like uh, goat and sheep's, you know, products, yeah, okay, and so, yes, they're high in selenium and zinc and omega-3 fatty acids, but, you know, in, in a lot of the other blue zone areas, they don't eat a lot of goat and sheep products, yeah, okay, so, you know, does that mean that's the definitive reason to why they're living, you know, into their 90s and, and 100s? Uh, without you know uh, serious ailments and diseases, well, it's probably not down to goats and sheep's products. I mean, there's there's definitely health benefits there, okay. But you know, they they, they drink milk thistle tea uh, every morning, yeah, okay. Milk thistle tea helps with glutathione production. Anything that helps with the liver function, okay, um, will will help with glutathione production. But once again, is like I, I think we're focusing on these aspects. Does that make sense, okay? And we're sort of missing you know, the common, the, the common traits that a lot of these blue zone areas uh, have, in, have in common. You, you look at Okinawa, uh, well, Okinawa, they, you know, um, their elderly population, they have the highest amount of elderly people that live independently, okay? So they're, and so they're still, uh, they, you know, they're still uh, fully capable of getting around. They're, they're very independent, okay? They're, now, there must be, uh, good reasons behind that, and I, and I don't think it's solely because you know they're consuming some special type of lime that they get in Okinawa, or you know the the type of soy that they're uh, consuming, like natto, and or like do, do you know what I mean? Like I'm not saying that these things don't have their nutritional benefit, but I just think if we want to look at some of the the major things that are going to have you know like a huge cascade effect and. Uh, multifaceted benefit and it really is that community aspect that they have in common that's what we need to really start modeling um, a, a lot better where we tend to be going more away from that that community aspect again okay? like um, and like uh, you know just one aspect on the community aspect um, something that I talk about is a particular protein molecule it's called brain derived neurotrophic factor so it's BDNF Okay, so there's, there's many things that actually help with the production of that protein molecule. So, for instance, things like curcumin, um, you know, fasting is, is, is one that they talk about a lot for BDNF. Okay, and it, it's very, very good for helping you to produce that. Um, you know, uh, things like resveratrol and, you know, even, um, you know, things like ice therapy and all these types of things can help with that. But actually, one of the most, you know, uh, fundamental things that we can start to uh, apply in our lifestyle that actually helps with the highest amount of brain derived neurotropic factor is community, you know, yeah, like, right. uh, breathing, yeah, like breathing together. Yeah. Um, training together. Yeah. Um, and as I said, all those, you know, biochemical advantages that you're getting from doing those things, they're just amplified even more in a, in a group setting. And, you know, you, you've been involved yourself in a lot of like, uh, things like diaphragmatic breathing and, and ice therapy. And when you do that by yourself, I mean, of course you can feel the benefits, but how impactful is it when you actually do it in a, a large group? Yeah, it really, it really does have a different 
feel to it and and power to it you know and it's so funny because you do like I've sat there by myself and done the breathing and I'm it's just like oh, I'm not getting it today but it's like you say it's not really because you're doing anything different it's probably just because you're not surrounded by that energy and that vibe and everyone just correct on the yeah mate yeah it's just I was just gonna say like one podcast with you is never enough. You know, the, the yeah. level of complexity and um, insight that you can go into is just so fascinating. And I just encourage anyone to look into the work that you've done because it's, it's mind blowing, right? It's so for, for a, a bit of a, a health, I wouldn't say health geek, but a, a bit of a, a geek on, on development and, and understanding people as a whole, as complex as we are trying to, um, you know, you're a person that is, should be highly encouraged to look up and check out because, yeah, mate, it's it's incredible the stuff that you do. But I was going to say, like, you could, I mean, we could talk for hours about the in-depth complexities of humans and every single every single system that operates and every hormone that is a part of that operation, but. I mean, what have, what have you found in regards to all those complexities and then um, what the simple elements of, of health and longevity and just optimal living, like what, is, what have you found to be the, the simple but yet really beneficial kind of um, complex and multifaceted elements of yeah, living that you bring into your life and, and to the life of your um clients and and all the people that you train with yeah i mean it's, that's a it's a it's a great question yeah because the, like the one thing is the human body and i always say this the human body is is complex yeah the, the, the human body is complex and like always my approach has been i've always got to treat the individual okay and i've I really got to treat treat the individual um and you know, what I need to apply is not going to be the same from one person to the next. Because what ultimately what we're, we're sort of doing, especially in the, the health industry and the fitness industry, is we're trying to sometimes find something like a generic approach that sort of applies to everyone. Okay, And you sort of see that in nutrition. You, you see this in like even the fitness realms where they're trying, you know, like uh, like everyone do this this fitness app and this type of training and and the reality is that, yes, there's a certain uh, segment of the population that that's going to work for, okay, but it's sort of like, you know, it's like throwing something against a wall and just hoping it sticks. And for some people it sticks and then for a large majority it doesn't because what's going on with me in a particular moment in time is, all, of course, that's going to be very different to what's going on with you in a particular moment in time, yeah, okay? And so the, the human body, yes, it's very complex and what's going on wrong with someone's internal environment can be very very complex you've heard me talk and it can sound very confusing yeah okay but also a lot of the the, the things that i that i utilize they're not as complex okay as as it sounds when i'm explaining how the human body works and a lot of the things that i use they're very multifaceted okay so i i, I use things that i'm not just going to play on a particular you know pathway or a particular mechanism that that they'll play on this, but then they'll also have a knock-on effect to that. Then they'll have a knock-on effect to that. You know, I like to use, you know, healing mechanisms that are very multifaceted in terms of how they work and safeguard where like it's not like a specialised herb from Tibet or something like that. that yes, may help with some particular hormonal function, but then, you know, long-term by taking it, it, it throws out something out over here and then you end up having to take something to, patch up what's gone wrong here does that make sense yeah okay um and so you know like i i I try to look at that cascade aspect with people okay so what can i really fix up with the majority of people that's going to have some of the biggest cascade effect in the body okay and always like maybe you've heard me talk about this before but i like to talk about it because it's easy for people to use this analogy yeah okay um and the analogy is the waterfall analogy Okay, and the, have you ever heard me talk about the waterfall analogy before? Yeah, I have, but uh, riff away, man. It's a good one. <laughs> yeah, so the waterfall analogy is, um, look, it is something that I actually came up with and I just thought that would make, that makes perfect sense and it makes sense to explain this to people when, they, when they're not quite sure what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about, you know, secretory IGA or some sort of hormone or something like that. I go, well, how can I put this into analogy where people are going to really understand this 
this cascade effect in the body, yeah, okay? And the waterfall analogy is, okay, if I had a waterfall and it wasn't flowing properly, okay, and I said to you, Magil, like, I want you to find out, okay, why this waterfall is not flowing properly. Like, what part of the waterfall would you ultimately go to? Yeah, well, obviously you'd go to the top of the waterfall there, Dave. Yeah, you, you, you go to the top of the waterfall, yeah, okay? And what I say to people, the top of the waterfall is food. So that's the, that's the quality of the food that you put in your body because, like, and I don't, I don't know why we keep on hiding away from this, yeah, okay? Um, you know, I've heard certain people say, you know, look, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins, okay? But I remember when I went to one of his events, he said, because obviously his whole thing is all about, like, positive energy and, um, and, I, and I don't disagree with him. It's incredibly important. You can ch- change your whole biochemical state and so forth through positive energy, okay? But he actually said something where he said, well, where are you getting energy from, okay? And he said, food, okay? Well, food doesn't make you, make you feel energized. And I, and I 100% disagree with that. 100% disagree with that. If you're finding that when you interact with food that it doesn't give you energy, then that's a problem with how you're interacting with food. That's not a problem with food. So there's either a problem with the quality of the food that you're putting in your body or there's, there's a problem with the area that has to interact with that food, which is most likely your gastrointestinal lining, okay? And so your gastrointestinal lining is not able to assimilate the singular molecules and minerals and micronutrients that you need to enable you to, to, to help with like metabolic and enzymatic processes and chemical reactions in the body. But that's not a problem with the food, okay? Because food, when you consume it, it should be energizing, okay? So, so that's one aspect. Like people just need to understand because, you know, uh, food gives us the molecules that we require uh, to enable us to function. Like where do you think your brain chemicals come from? Where do you think your hormones come from, okay? Well, you know, I always say this. You don't have like Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory in there. You don't have like Oompa Loompas, okay, and then they're just churning out this endless supply of hormones and, and neurotransmitters, brain chemicals and cytokines and interleukins. All these things have got to come from amino acids and, 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 and macronutrients and, mi- and micronutrients. I mean, that's ultimately, so it's, got to, it's got to come from food. So there's big problems, yeah, with the quality of the food that we're putting in our body. Okay, like if people ask me, like, what type of nutritional outline do you think is the best? And I go, well, I don't believe in a particular nutritional outline for the, for the rest, rest of your life. It can really benefit you according to what's going on with your biochemistry at a particular time, your, your microbiome imbalances, what's going on with your, with, with your gastrointestinal lining. But it's just a tool that you need to use to help to support your body in that moment in time. Um, but where I, where I think, you know, definitely a lot of things have gone wrong is in the quality of the food that we're putting in our body. It's genetically modified, so we change the change the molecular structure. Which you know, if I use uh, you know the wheat wheat as an example, okay, we genetically modified wheat to have higher concentrations of gliadin. Okay, gliadin is, is the problematic uh, protein molecule in gluten. You got glutenin, and then you got gliadin. Gliadin tends to be the problematic protein molecule. And guess what? Whether you're celiac, non-celiac, okay, gliadin stimulates a particular protein called zonulin. Okay, and tell zonulin to op- open up the tight junctions. So you o- open up the top section of the tight junctions and, and exacerbating and causing more hyperpermeability. And that's whether you're celiac, non-celiac. Yeah, okay? Now, what happens if I you know, genetically modify the, you know, the wheat so it has higher concentrations of the gliadin because the person wants their bread to be more fluffy and binding and so they can hold their sausage in and all these types of things that make sense, okay? Yeah. Well, you, you, you're genetically modifying so that it has a higher concentration of that. If it has a higher concentration of the gliadin molecule, well, it's causing that reaction on a more frequent basis, which means you're causing more hyperpermeability, which means you're ramping up antigen response and antibody response. And so we're changing the structure of food. You know, like dairy is a, is a great example. What I can get really frustrated with, Magil, is this people um, demonizing and persecuting food. And that's where, that's where we're getting to the point where people say dairy is bad for you. you go, that's not true. Dairy is good for you. Okay? Now, yes, from an ancestral epigenetic perspective, certain people don't necessarily do that well on dairy, but just understand there's also a huge proportion of the population do extremely well on dairy. Okay? You look at butter, it's got Wolzen factor. Wolzen factor helps to drive calcium into your bones, helps with bone density. Okay? 
You look at things like ghee, butter, really high in butyrate. Yeah, okay. Well, butyrate helps with T regulatory cells, recognition of your own uh, immune system, stopping you getting from autoimmune diseases. Yeah, okay. There's glucoslingolipids and things like raw milk. Yeah, okay. That helps with gastrointestinal infections. Yeah, okay. There, you know, you got like immunoglobulins. Okay, that helps with aspects of like antigen and antibody response. Yeah, okay. So there's, you know, vitamin K is very high in dairy, helps with vasodilation, blood flow, circulation. So there's a lot of, you know, key molecules and key compounds and nutrients that we get out of dairy. But once again, what have we done to dairy? Like pasteurized dairy. Stripped it out, man. Yeah. 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 Pasteurized dairy. And like, you know, you, you want to know why so many people respond so poorly to dairy is because pasteurized dairy. Okay. Because pasteurized dairy. Okay, so your ability to produce lactase, okay, which is really dependent on, you know, the gastrointestinal lining and the epithelium and what damage has occurred there, ranges anywhere from 1% to 95%. Okay, now, yes, ancestrally, some people like Oriental people, Asian people can be more do- down the lower spectrum because they didn't have a lot of dairy in their, in their traditional nutritional outline. Um, but you look at Europeans, they generally consumed a lot of dairy, yeah, okay? But if you've got damage to the gastrointestinal lining, you can struggle to produce lactase from the epithelium. Now, what's the benefit of having things like raw milk, you know, uh, you know, organic cream, organic butter, okay? They've actually got like the, the, the raw milk contains lactase, okay? Yeah. So it contains lactase, so it allows you to break down the lactose, okay? Combine that with having better structure in the epithelium then you're going to be okay with the, with the lactose. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. But you look, at, you look at pasteurized dairy, well, pasteurized dairy doesn't contain lactase. Okay. Now, and so, so, so now we're dealing with, you know, uh, glucose molecules like lactose. Yeah, okay. And guess what? If I've got damage within the gastrointestinal lining and I start drinking something like pasteurized dairy, the pasteurized dairy can just sit there. It's not getting broken down. So it sits there and ferments. Okay. And if it sits there and ferments because we're dealing with glucose molecules, it can encourage like bacterial issues like SIBO, like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But once again, like the point I'm trying to get across, is this the is this the issue with dairy? Okay. Or is this the issue with what we've actually done to the to the food? Okay. Same thing, you know, with things like meat. You know, people say meat's bad for you. I go, no, poor quality meat is bad for you. Meat isn't not bad, meat's not bad for you. Okay. And once again, if it's not, if it's grain fed, you know, and, and those grains contain things like, you know, Roundup herbicides and pesticides, okay, well, where do you think animals, just like ourselves, where do we store a lot of our toxins? We store them in our adip- adipose cells, adipocytes, in our, in our fat cells. And so the animal stores a lot of those toxins in the fat cells. And then if we, you know, that's why a lot of the time they were saying to cut the meat off, uh, a lot of animal protein because yes, it's, it's not good for you. But if it's coming from grass fed, grass finished, you know things like game meat, okay, uh, good quality meat, then actually the the fat within the animal is exceptionally good for you. So once again, it's just more what we've done to you know even things like you know non organic you know fruits and vegetables. You know I talk about this. The, the amazing things about like fruits is the phytonutrients. And those phytonutrients like anthocyanins helps against, uh, you know, things like gout. Okay. So it helps excess amounts of like uric acid. Okay. Helps with even aspects like blood sugar management. Okay. So these phytonutrients, they're part of the fruit's immune system. So, so, and it protects it against, you know, insects and, uh, and pests. That's why the fruit develops the, the phytonutrients. Okay. Now, once again, if I spray it, with herbicides and you know um, pesticides and insecticides and all these types of things, yeah, okay. Well, then the fruit perceives that it doesn't need to produce these phytonutrients, yeah, okay. And so you could be consuming the fruit, okay. It doesn't really mean you're getting the phytonutrients. And so once again, we sort of change that structure of the the fruits and the vegetables, like hydroponic tomatoes. Well, one of the best things about tomatoes, okay, is the lycopene. Well, they tested backyard tomatoes against hydroponic tomatoes lycopene is really good for anti-cancer properties okay so this is a, this is a phytonutrient as well um and that's what gives a lot of fruits and vegetables like the red color but you need it for things like bile you know helps with gallbladder function 
Okay, so that helps with detoxification and emulsification of fats. Lycopene is, is amazing. Um, and they actually found that by backyard tomatoes, really rich in lycopene, but the hydroponic tomatoes have no lycopene. So once again, like it, it comes down to like, what have we done to the, to the structure and what have we done to the quality of the food? So ultimately, even if you think you're eating good, clean food, doesn't necessarily mean you're getting all the, a lot of the, the nutrients that you should be getting. Same thing, like, you know, like Brazil nuts, okay? Well, everyone would look up Wikipedia and Wikipedia would say, Brazil nuts are the highest source of selenium, okay? And selenium is a free radical scavenger. I need it to help me convert, you know, thyroxine T4 to T3, so it helps with the thyroid, okay? So once again, like, like a lot of essential processes in the human body, okay? But, you know, they've actually done, so the soil is where the selenium is rich, okay? So once again, if the Brazil nuts aren't growing in the soil that is rich in selenium, okay, just because Wikipedia says they should be high, in selenium, it doesn't mean the Brazil nuts are high in selenium. And now what they're finding is a lot of Brazil nuts aren't high in selenium. And selenium is actually higher in things like maybe even things like sea kelp, yeah, okay, um, uh, and even things like animal proteins, yeah, okay. So even things like goat and sheep, because the, the you know the the grasses and the and the and the plant matter that they're eating, the soil is a lot higher in selenium. Does that make sense? So I know I've gone a bit on a bit of a rant there, but but. You can actually see like we're just like there's so many aspects here that we're just changing the original structure of food, which means that's going to have a big impact how it interacts internally in the body. Um, and then the sort of the, the next area, so that's the top of the waterfall, food, the quality of the food that you're putting in your body because that essentially is where all these molecules and all these compounds come from. Yeah, I, You know, I just ask your listeners just to remember it is literally, it is not, in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory in there, okay? Yeah, like yeah. most people go, oh, you know, oh, I just got hormones. What? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> They're not just there. They've got, to, they've got to come from somewhere, yeah, okay? Oh, they go, oh, they come from your endocrine glands. That's where they get excreted from, somewhere they come from. You still need the building blocks, okay? The uh, building so blocks the, the, for the hormones. Correct, yeah, yeah okay? Uh, the, and it's then, the food and that we eat. Yeah, exactly. Like that gives us the building blocks. And then what we uh, need to understand, Magil, is the, the, the middle section of the waterfall, that's your digestive system. That's the, mm. that's the area that has to assimilate. You yeah, take the food, break it down from large molecules into singular molecules, okay, to give us the building blocks that we need for things like neurotransmitters, okay, that we need for things like hormones, Okay, and that's like your epithelium. That's your that's your mucosal cells. Okay, and I always say like so those epithelium are in your lungs, they're in your stomach, they're in your small intestine, they're, and you're in your large intestine. And what people need to understand is those epithelium that they, they are so important. Like I just cannot do them justice in in a in a podcast because I would literally talk about them by themselves for hours. Yeah, okay, but they help us produce gut hormones, and those gut hormones are only produced from those epithelium. They help us produce the enzymes to enable us to break down the macronutrients. They help us to produce molecules like protein molecules that are key players in our immunology, our immune system. And our immune system is dependent on that. Like, you know, people need to understand the major player in the innate immune system, so initial responder, is your gut lining. It's the biggest physical barrier in the human body. Yes, your skin is a physical barrier. It's not the biggest one. It's not even close. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And we're focusing on like wash your hands. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying this is not a barrier. Okay. But if I took the mucosa and the lamina propria and gut associated lymphoid tissue, this is the tissue underneath those epithelium and stretch that out, that would stretch out for 240 to 300 meters. That's the size of 10 tennis courts. The highest amount of antigen and immune response and antibody response takes place in the gastrointestinal line. Why? Because we're, frequently eating and that creates an immune response again this is how important these epithelium are okay you know they they even play roles in detoxification 25 percent of detoxification takes place in the gastrointestinal lining starts in the gut and it finishes in the gut elimination needs to take place through the gastrointestinal lining and that's why i put so much focus on this this area um, and that is that those little mucosal cells and all these different types of epithelium they're basically just type 1 collagen they're just connective tissue so they're just basically made up of hydroxyproline 
proline, glycine, arginine. You need vitamin C, helps with the repair of collagen. You need B6, which is pyridoxine, okay, which actually helps us assimilate the singular amino acids that we need for the, the epithelium structure. You need things like copper, you need manganese, and you need zinc, and zinc actually helps to give elasticity uh, to things like tendons and ligaments, okay, which means with the epithelium, it helps with things like motility, like intestinal churning. It's like a soup that we need. Uh, and, you know, that's the same thing that makes up things like other connective tissue, like tendons, like ligaments, like bone, like cartilage, like muscle, okay? And all I say to people is can you wear down things like tendons, ligament, bone, muscle? Well, yes. So yeah. can, you wear down your, can you wear down your gut lining? Okay, and so if you wear down your gut lining and you affect how it is starting to interact with the food and how you assimilate the food coming in, okay, is that going to have a knock-on effect to other internal functions in the body? Well, of course, because the, the way I always explain the epithelium is the epithelium is like the ecosystem for the microbiome. It's their, it's their forest. Okay, and I might use that analogy a little bit later as well. Yeah, okay. But it's it's that that's the environment that they need. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And with your and with your and with your bacteria, is like a uh, like a happy families in there. And about eighty five percent of your bacteria should be good, and about fifteen percent should be bad. Okay. And look, and, and it's all about ratios. I'm not here to demonize the bad bacteria because guess what? With the with the with the correct ratio. They have a symbiotic relationship with the good bacteria. Does that make sense? So they serve a purpose. I'm not here to de demonize things like candida and yeast, negative gram bacteria, okay? Because as a, I believe in, the, in this, this, this harmony and this symbiotic relationship, okay? And once we start to ruin the ratio because we basically ruined the ecosystem, okay? And so when we re ruin the, the ecosystem, we can, we can, we can off-skew the balance. So all of a sudden we could have higher ratios of the opportunistic bacteria. And the problem is with some of that opportunistic bacteria, Magil, okay, is that some of their byproducts, okay, you look at things like yeast and candida and parasites, okay, um, well, they, 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 they produce particular byproducts like acetaldehyde, which is what you get from, you know, cigarette smoke, car exhaust fumes, alcohol, and the acetaldehyde damages uh, tight junction protein. So you start to... Uh, and, and one of the major tight junction proteins that damages is occludin. And that actually affects uh, the structure of the intracellular tight junctions, creating more hyperpermeability. And so we ramp up antibody response and antigen response and immune response, but we, we're compromising the structure. Does that make sense? And, and that's because yeah. we've off skewed the balance. Yeah. And the same thing with like LPS, lipopolysaccharides, they also damage the tight junction proteins as well. Yeah, okay. And that will happen when we've, uh, once again, we've compromised that ecosystem. Okay. And then the issues here with the interaction of food, okay, is you can completely change how you interact even with healthy food if you don't have the right balance. Okay. Because I need particular microbiome to help me assimilate like L tryptophan that helps with things like 5 hydroxy L tryptophan, serotonin, melatonin. Okay, so once again, I need the microbiome to help me assimilate these to help me with things like brain chemicals, neurotransmitters. Okay, I need the, the microbiome to help me with things like tyrosine. Well, what does tyrosine help with? Thyroid hormones. Okay, tyrosine also helps with L dopa, dopamine, yeah, noepinephrine, epinephrine. These are catecholamines, dopamine, that's motivation, get up and go. So all of a sudden, my point being is, you're, you're affecting essentially the gastrointestinal lining, which is sort of like the filing cabinet, okay? It's like it's getting this stuff and it goes, okay, let's uh, break that down into this, okay? And then a lot of those molecules, those singular molecules, it gives it because once you go from the, the submucosa, which is like the bottom layer of the gastrointestinal lining, then it hits the liver. And then basically once they go to the liver, the liver will synthesize particular compounds that we need for other functions. Okay, and so the bottom section of the waterfall eventually got there. Okay, <laughs> the bottom section of the waterfall is the whitewash. Yeah, okay, and I always say, always say that the whitewash is basically the the interaction of what happens from the food and the gastrointestinal line. And so that's you know 
that interaction coming down the waterfall, the end result is that whitewash. Does it make sense? Okay. Yeah. And in, in, in the human body, that end result from that interaction of the food with the gastrointestinal lining is hormones, is neurotransmitters, is you know, uh, protein molecules like cytokines, interleukins that help with pro-inflammatory response anti-inflammatory response, glutathione, like the master antioxidant in the body. That's a tripeptide. Comes from three amino acids. Where do you think those three amino acids come from? Once again, it doesn't come from the oompa loompas. Yeah, okay? it, uh, those singular amino acids have, have to come from the gastrointestinal lining. Okay? And ultimately coming, deriving from our food. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay? yeah. And so, uh, and, and so where, we, where we've tried to stuff around a lot, okay, is in the whitewash, okay? And the one thing I know, trying to understand why something not, is not flowing properly and you're stuffing around in the whitewash, okay? So, so we're, trying, and we're trying to manipulate particular pathways. We're trying to ma manipulate particular neurotransmitters. Oh, so why are you lacking that neurotransmitter? Okay, let's take something to try and manipulate that, yeah, okay? But the problem is what you're, what you're actually looking at is you're looking at the end byproduct. Yeah. You're looking Absolutely. at the end byproduct and you're not actually looking at where the problem actually started from in the first place. Yeah. Okay. And so, yes, you can use some mechanism to help with this function. Okay. But then ultimately what's going to happen, like something else is going to go out. Yeah. And, that, and, and, that, and, and that's the analogy that I, I, I like to use because if I want to, if I want to, um, and, and hopefully this, this does answer your question, if I want to look at how I can ha initially have the biggest cascade effect for the, for the overall population is clean up the food that they're eating and the quality of the food that they're eating and fix the area that has to interact with those food molecules. Yeah. Okay. And so generally, so if you want to know an approach that I use to help with you know, pretty much every single person I deal with, the approach is looking at the quality of that food and cleaning up the gastrointestinal lining, okay? And if I clean up the gastrointestinal lining, just to understand, there's more messages sent from the gut to the brain than the other way around, Yeah. okay? And what I always say, Magical, to people is like, a lot of people will turn around and say to me is, um, but I don't, I don't have gastrointestinal symptoms. Like I don't have, so I don't have gastrointestinal problems. And I go, well, that's, that's where the issue lies is that you, you think there's no association from one area to the other, okay? And from my experience, okay, um, gastrointestinal problems very rarely initially show up, yeah, with gastrointestinal symptoms, huh, okay? Wow. Most of the time they will actually show up with neurological problems, so things like anxiety, nervousness, you know, uh, you know addiction issues, uh, reinforcement issues, a person needing, needing constant validation, yeah, okay? Um, and these are generally a sign of like severe gastrointestinal problems and mic uh, microbiome imbalances and, and opportunistic bacterial byproducts, yeah, okay? And also just showing up with like no energy, you know, poor ATP, adenosine triphosphate, just so, and, and so, you know, a, a lot of gastrointestinal problems, yeah, okay? are just actually going to show up with these types of symptoms. Does that make sense? But yeah. even under, the, the problem is, is that most people associate, um, oh, look, if I've, if I've got issues like anxiety and depression and I'm taking antidepressants, it's got nothing to do with my gut. And they, it's got everything to do with your gut. Okay? The, the, the connection that I like to um, say to people, Madhul, is like your there's within the enteric nervous system, so that's the nervous system that exists between your gut and your brain, okay? You produce up to 30 neurotransmitters in this region. And that's some of the major ones like serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, okay? Like GABA is really dependent on your, on your gastrointestinal lining because it's, it's actually dependent on bifidobacterium, okay, which is a positive gram bacteria, 32 different strains of that, okay? So it's really dependent to actually help with the production of brain chemicals, neurotransmitters, okay? Um, and a, a lot of people ask me, so, okay, so what is the, the gut dependent on the brain for, okay? Now, it is dependent on lots of things, yeah, okay? But one thing that I like to say is the gut is dependent on the brain to not stress it out. 
Wow. Okay. So, so <laughs> when we've got a when we've got a lot of overstimulation of the HPA axis or the stress axis, okay. So we've got a lot of perceived stress. We've got a lot of emotional stress, psychological stress, um, childhood tra- trauma, childhood stress, all these types of things. The area in the body that really cops the brunt of a lot of these negative emotions, okay, and ramped up catecholamines and stress hormones is the gastrointestinal lining. Wow. Okay. And, and, when you, and when you start to affect the function of the gastrointestinal lining, okay, so you affect, you know, uh, the microbiome balance, well, then all of a sudden you are affecting things like your hormones. You are affecting the, the modulation of things like estrogen and progesterone. Yeah. Okay. Um, you are affecting a lot of these, uh, like these key functions. Like one, one example, like I, I want to give you, yeah, okay, um, that I, that I that I talk about, like, is there's this key uh, overlap, okay, and so the overlap that I'm talking about here is they say the most important years for our emotional development, okay, is between the ages of zero to three. I don't know if you've heard of that, heard that before. Yeah, I've heard a lot about. Um you know, the, the development between like the ages of zero to seven is when you get like, you know, developed as a person and you can't essentially, and then going on from that, you know, give a, I think there was an old saying with the Perusians or something that give us the boy until seven and then we'll give you back the man. And it's just like that whole development. But I didn't, I haven't heard from the zero to three being such a, that timeline. Yeah. Well, one, one person I really like, just love listening to and uh, look, I, I, w- I would say he's probably my favourite person to listen to on podcasts is actually a physician called Dr. Gabor Mate. Oh, and, yeah. And, and Dr. Yeah, right? and, and, and Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a, a Hungarian-Canadian, yeah, okay? Yeah. And he, he, he actually specialises in addiction uh, and he also specialises in uh, childhood trauma, okay, and childhood stress, yeah, okay? Um, and he basically says that, you know, from an early age, the most important uh, aspect to a child, and it makes perfect sense, yeah, okay, is the relationship uh, uh, with the parents. So the relationship from the child to the mother and the father is the most important to protect. And the, and the child will protect that relationship uh, for, for all costs. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Yes. And so let's say, that, you know, that's quite traumatic. It could be an abusive parent or maybe, maybe the the, the the parents are going through a divorce, they're fighting, yeah, okay? Well, the child will teach itself a lot of defence mechanisms to protect that relationship. Does that make sense? And that may include uh, blocking out the noise. If it's an abusive parent, if it's a, a parent that, um, you know, um, that's hitting, uh, you know, uh, hitting the wife or could be the opposite way around, yeah, okay? Well, then because the child wants to protect that relationship between the parents, okay, it learns to block out the noise, okay? And if it learns to block out the noise, it, it forges that neural pattern over and over again. And that could lead, lead to things like ADHD later on in life, yeah. okay? Attention deficit disorder because it's the, the, the child has taught itself to block out the noise, okay? And they basically say that a lot of that neural priming, okay, it can 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 show up later on in your in your adult life because you've primed it over and over again sort of makes sense yeah okay Uh, and so they they really say that that between the the ages of zero three a lot of that neural priming from an emotional perspective really takes place does that make sense okay now i really found this interesting yeah okay because a lot of the things that i preach which a lot of it does come down to the gastrointestinal lining yeah okay and i'm not saying that the gut is the mecca of everything it's close. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And so the, the, the one thing that I say is it's really interesting when you start to uh, dive into this a little bit deeper. Okay. Now, if you actually look at it, um, your microbiome fully develops in the first thousand days. Okay. Which is okay. basically first three years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You look at it, you're the gastrointestinal lining. Okay. That fully uh, starts to evolve and develop within the first three years, okay? And your immune system starts to fully evolve and develop within the first three years. So you've got your emotional development, okay? 
you've got your gastrointestinal lining, you've got your immune system, which obviously your gastrointestinal lining is a huge player when it comes to your immune system, and you've got your microbiome, okay? Well, they're all within the first three years, okay? And so for me, they're interconnected, okay? And if I take out one of those, I will have detrimental harm on the others, okay? And so if my gut lining does, does not fully develop, okay, that connective tissue, okay, there's issues with its structure, okay, it's, it's uh, the intracellular tight junctions, the tight junction proteins, they're not developing as they should, okay, that's going to affect my emotional state. Yeah. That's going to affect my mood and my behavior, okay, um, you know, stress resilience, okay. Now, likewise, if my emotional state is affected, well, that's going to have a detrimental uh, effect on the development of my microbiome, my gastrointestinal lining, my immune system, okay? And so my point is that we need to be fundamental, fundamentally looking at how we, we help and how we preserve all four of these aspects so because what, our whole... So what do we do if we're, we're, you know, 30, 40, 50 years old now and we're learning this and then... You know what's the what's the ability to to repair reverse kind of all that all that stuff that's been laid down yeah and so that's that's obviously what i you know i'm doing with a lot of people and you know one of the first areas that i really start to 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 fix is the the gastrointestinal lining the epithelium yeah okay now you know from my experience not it like everyone you know some people are going to say not everyone has you know, like intestinal permeability and, and things like leaky guts and, you know, not everyone's got gastrointestinal issues. And really for me, like people are basing that on the fact that they're saying, well, not everyone's got gastrointestinal symptoms. Yeah. Okay. So traditional gastrointestinal symptoms. And because, they, because they're basing it on the tradi- traditional gastrointestinal symptoms, that's where the mistake is. Okay. Because, you know, from my experience, okay, the, the the large majority and pretty much all of uh, you know uh, people within Western countries have some form some form of intestinal permeability taking place. They they've got some sort of uh, gut dysbiosis and, or some sort of you know compromisation of the epithelium or the, the the you know the tight junctions or the intracellular tight junctions. They've got some sort of compromisation there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I- I feel like, you know, like that's one of those things that um, has probably existed in people for so long that they're just so used to it and it's like, oh, it's always like that so it's not a problem. And I feel like that could be said about so many other things too, like um, just like um, the mental clarity or the ability to, not the ability, but like the, the general state of being, whether it's like in a state of somewhat of happiness or joy or, you know, like, or just any state of um, homeostasis that our body has just kind of like come to exist in. It's like, oh, well, that's fine because that's the way it always is. But like, we don't even know what, what that, how that is operating like, like suboptimally because we're just so yeah, used yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like people, uh, people don't, you know, the, the body is always going to realign its homeostasis. Okay. And so it's always going to realign its, its baseline and its homeostasis according to the, alis, the allostatic load, the stress load. Mm. Okay. And so, you know, um, if it, it realigns it, that becomes the new norm for the individual. Okay. And the new norm for the individual when they've got things like gastrointestinal issues, which is probably manifesting with new, neurological problems and mood disorders and, as I said, addiction profiles and reinforcement profiles and all these types of things, okay, is that that becomes the new homeostasis, that becomes the new baseline. And so the person just perceives, you know, not having energy now and then, that's normal, okay, okay. or having these neurological problems, having brain fog, okay, having poor short-term t- uh, to long-term memory, not having a good capacity to be able to retain information. They go, well, that's just normal and that's part of the aging process. And I'm, I'm here to tell people, that's incorrect, okay? Because actually my brain capacity, my ability to retain information has actually got greater as I've got older. Yeah. Okay, and the reason it's actually got greater 
is because I've done far more work on myself than I did when I was younger. What what I am just so interested in that make is sense? like yeah yeah it 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 does make sense it's it's um it's a lot of information for sure but it it yeah. it all connects like you say it's all connected you know the the depth of knowledge that um that you've got and the way you pass that on to people I know a number of people that have worked with you in the past and actually um you know it was Julie Kluwer who put me on to Gabor Mate. Um, initially and I can't help but think that's probably just gone full circle because you've mentioned it there. <laughs> but um yeah so um yeah so um, one of my big questions was how do you unlock the the desire in people and generate a reason why they should do something differently you know what I mean like so yeah. often people are like you can give them all the information lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink like you, you've got so much knowledge and experience to pass on to people and can genuinely help a lot of people and you have. But what have you come to understand is like the best way or an, even a way to, to understand how to unlock that desire for someone to change? Yeah, it's another great question, Nigel, yeah. It's uh, like, uh, look, one, you know, feedback that I get on a constant basis is that I'm full on. Okay, that I'm full on and I ask too much. Like I ask too much of uh, people and I like I'm, o- I'm, I'm an oversharer, okay, and that I bombard people with too much information, um, which I'm definitely guilty of, okay. And the one thing I can reassure people is that the reason sometimes I can, you know, over-educate and overshare is because I'm so passionate about it, okay. And the more passionate I get, the more technical I get something I'm definitely like working on because I understand not everyone has the same passion for, you know, things like the epithelium and the gut lining and biochemistry and all these types of things. Um, And I've always thought about, you know, giving people smaller things to focus on and smaller things to concentrate on. Okay. And I've always really battled with this magic. Yeah. Um, But also one thing is that, I refuse to treat people like children. Yeah. Okay. And one one uh, thing that I did never really um, gravitated towards in terms of messaging to people is is treating them like spoon feeding them like they're like they're toddlers. Oh, you, you can't say that because they like they don't understand that. Okay. And I go, yeah, I'm, I understand they don't understand it, but I need what I need the individual to understand is how important this is. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Like if I just say, look, protein is really important because it helps with things like muscle growth. Well, guess what? That's not that that important to a lot of people. And so all of a sudden, it just doesn't become important. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, if I rattle off all these different mechanisms that proteins involved in, okay. Yes, you may, may not understand ninety percent of that, but also what you've walked away is going. That's really important. That's really important and I need to do it. Yeah. And, 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 and there's actually, this is a good reason to why I'm probably not functioning properly. Okay. And so I want to empower people. Okay. And now I really believe you empower people is through education. Okay. And, and empowering is not treating people like children. Yeah. Okay. You don't empower people by scolding them like a child which you probably shouldn't be doing anyway, yeah, okay? Um, you know, you're, 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 you're there to educate them, pass on experience, okay? And that's what I'm doing with people. I'm, edu- I'm educating them and I'm passing on experience and I'm passing on my knowledge, okay? I'm not expecting them to have the same knowledge as me and the same passion for it, okay? But by empowering with them with information, I empower them to really understand how important it is and that they need to take action. And, and, and so, like, and, and, it, and it's really unusual because a lot of people imagine when they, when they go through my protocols, they go, oh, yeah, look, it's just too much. There's just too many things I've got to focus on. And I don't disagree that, yes, a lot of people can be better focusing on one or two things, okay? But also I, I can find it sometimes ironic, okay? And what I mean by this is that people gravitate towards... Uh, 
you know, short-term gratification and people gravitate towards quick fixes. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, and when I talk about fixing the epithelium and the gastrointestinal lining, there are uh, quick fixes that will fix this at a more rapid rate. Okay. Like especially like the, the epithelium and the mucosal cells. Okay. It's actually proven that within nature, okay, that you can speed up the healing process of this epithelium within days, within about three days of just being in nature and being surrounded by the microbes within the soil and the microbes in the trees, okay, Um, you know, negative ions coming from things like streams and waterfalls and the ocean and so forth, okay. But also the reality is not everyone's going to go off the grid and live up in the mountains and the forests and so forth, so they're not getting exposed to that type of environment that is going to actually fast track that that process and the unfortunate thing is they're in an environment where the exacerbation of all these things like the herbicides and the pesticides and the pollutants and the psychological stress and the you know the 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 byproducts from you know opportunistic bacteria they're just constantly bombarding that epithelium so they're just not they're, they're just not in an environment okay that actually helps to speed up that that process quicker okay so there's the quick fixes do exist okay just not really in the environment that most of us live yeah. does that make sense yeah, okay now yeah. if if, if, I, if i want to help with those mucosal cells and the and the intracellular tight junctions the tight junction proteins well this is generally the formula that i need i would just run through some of them i need vitamin a when you've got gastrointestinal problems you struggle to absorb this fat soluble vitamin, vitamin A. Okay. So I can get that out of cod liver oil. I can get it out of slow cooked meats. Okay. Generally better from, you know, animal sources because not everyone makes the conversion of better carotene into vitamin A. 45% of the population have the BCM01 gene. They don't make that conversion. So I need vitamin A. I need EPA and DHA. Now, why? They help with prostaglandins. Prostaglandins uh, protect the epithelium in areas like the stomach lining. Okay. So then I've got to take, you know, something that's high in EPA, something that's high also in DHA. So I can cover this with things like cod liver oil, okay? You also need things that uh, mitigate pro-inflammatory cytokines and pro-inflammatory proteins, protect the intracellular tight junctions. I can get that from capric acid and luric acid. That's coconut oil, okay? Um, Now also things like quercetin, okay? That's That's a powerful antioxidant. It's a flavonoid. Okay, yes, you can get it from cherries, but most people, okay, they have to eat a lot of cherries to get enough quercetin, okay? So the quercetin helps with the formation of the intracellular tight junctions and some of the major filter tight junction proteins like occludin, claudine, okay? So something like quercetin. I need butyrate. Well, butyrate, yes, your body can produce it, okay? From the interaction of indigestible matter in the microbiome, they produce short-chain fatty acids. But butyrate, I can directly get out of things like ghee, okay? Butter, okay? Um, you need vitamin D, okay? From the sun, how many people are getting enough sun? Well, then potentially I may have to get it from a synthetic supplement. So vitamin D prevents pro-inflammatory peptides getting into the mucosa, that connective tissue, and damaging the mucosa and ultimately uh, impacting your like B cells, so affecting immune response, immunology, okay? Um, and so I guess one of the, the, the sort of points that I'm, you know, I'm getting across here, okay, so I basically in my protocols, I go, well, what do I need here? What, so what support? So I need the support from the question and I need the support from the, the vitamin A. I need the support of the vitamin D. I need the support of the coconut oil. I need the support of the G. And so then the person goes, oh, there's a lot in here that, I, that I've got to do and I've got to focus on. Oh, I go, because the reality is you want to try and quick you you want to try and fix this problem quicker. Yeah. Okay. If we only focus on one of these things, you are not going to fix what's going on in the in the in the gastrointestinal lining, okay, quickly. It's gonna be a very, very slow process. Yeah. Okay. If we're looking for a quicker fix, you in, 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 in company, encompassing and, and taking on board everything that I'm asking you to do, the reality is it is the quick fix. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. 
That's a yeah, Does that's that a penny sense? drop, mate. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's absolutely. what people don't realize. They go, Oh, it's just too much, and there's too many things to focus on. And I just go, Yeah, but just so you understand, this is the quick fix. This is this is actually embark in and taking on board all these things is going to speed up this healing process way quicker if we just took one thing or, yeah. you know, and, and, and most of the time, you know, people are taking uh, things to, to mitigate, you know, symptoms, um, you know, and you can see that like uh, in, you know, in a lot of the medications that people were taking and the people really understood, you know, people taking things like aspirin. Okay. Um, you know, and, and people take that to help with like, you know, blood thinning and, and these types of things, well, aspirin inhibits prostaglandins. And what I, what prostaglandins derive from omega-3s. That's why I want someone to have things like EPA and DHA. And the, the prostaglandins, they protect the epithelium, especially in areas like the stomach. Mm. Okay. And so that means it actually helps with things like, like stomach acid, yeah, okay? hydrochloric acid, intrinsic factor, all these types of things. So they're me taking the aspirin is having a detrimental effect on the epithelium in areas like the stomach lining, okay? Like even, you know, uh, protein pump inhibitors, okay? You know, um, yes, you know, they, 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 can, they can play on like uh, what they call H2 receptors, histamine receptors, okay? But just to understand that to, to actually help with the release of things like hydrochloric acid, okay, like stomach acid and intrinsic factor, and the most important things about like hydrochloric acid and gastric acid is it's antimicrobial yeah so yeah. it stops the proliferation of bacteria and stops things like h pylori clostridium uh diff okay uh so stopping these pathogenic bacteria from proliferating in certain areas of the gastrointestinal line so they're taking the the ppi ppis okay and that's causing opportunistic bacterial complications antihistamines okay they, they, they've definitely been linked to overgrowth of clostridium uh, difficile, okay? So, you know, a lot of people are taking these medications for a short-term solution to mitigate the symptoms that they're experiencing, okay? Um, you know, even NSAIDs, like ibuprofens, they're so mm -hmm. detrimental to the, to the structure of the, the, uh, the epithelium and the intracellular tight junctions in not just the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, okay? And so many, yeah. so, and but imagine, you know, uh, imagine you, imagine, imagine how many people are taking like all of these things, yeah, to mitigate all the symptoms that they're that they've got. And then the problem is they're actually causing more damage to these yeah. areas, causing more bacterial opportunistic bacterial proliferation. And then the bacterial byproducts, okay, they're damaging the gut lining even more. But not not only that, the bacterial byproducts. They start damaging the blood-brain barrier outside of the blood-brain barrier. Some of these uh, byproducts from bacteria, especially things like yeast and candida and parasites, can permeate through the blood-brain barrier, get up into the brain, and 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 produce other chemical compounds. Cell solenol. Guess what? That's been linked to Parkinson's disease. Okay, uh, and and yeah. that's actually it, it causes this spontaneous release of dopamine. So these people display more addiction profiles. So addicted to sugar, um, alcohol, training, sex, gambling. It also causes higher um, reinforcement profiles. And like people go, what, what, what does Dave mean by reinforcement profiles? Well, that basically means validation. So the person yeah, wow. needs constant validation. Yeah, okay. Now, I'm sure everyone understands we've got that at the drop of a hat now, okay, yeah. because we've got social media. Facebook, Instagram, okay? So you, you, you can see how detrimental a lot of these bacterial byproducts can be yeah. just to our mood and our behavior, okay? Not, a, not only that, but the acetaldehyde that derives from the, the parasite and the candida and CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, is another one that um, it, gets, it, it forms in the brain. It's called tetrahydropapaverine. That actually affects the biosynthesis of serotonin. So the person starts to display anxiety, nervousness, depression. It's neurotoxic to dopamine, so more dopamine issues. Now, the only reason I brought that up is, once again, the person's displaying all these 
mood disorders, addiction profiles, you know, reinforcement, they're addicted to constant reinforcement and validation. And then once again, they turn around and go, well, I don't have a gut issue though. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Dave. Unreal, Does that make sense? Like, oh, yeah. It, it, it totally, it is, it is incredible. It is a secret to some people, but it really shouldn't be that. Everything is connected. It's so funny how we can separate us, like, as one thing, how we say, oh, you know, we're human and that's outside. We're human and that's nature. But, like, that's just one example of how we're all connected. And I guess the same thing is within our body. I know there's a lot to be said about the body and the mind, but really it is the same thing and to treat them so differently and separate is is really doing it a disjustice and and it is not really going to help like solve the real problem of many things because it it will just be a band-aid and um what I was what I was going to ask and I don't want to drop this on you too heavily but like how do you do all of this right on a plant-based diet man yeah um Look, I'm not into – look, look, you know, for listeners, I am an advocate of animal protein, okay? Um, so, but I'm not into, you know, people making the decision, um, you know, that they want to be more plant-based, okay? Um, one thing that I want to get across, Majul, is like I do think um, that – the gastrointestinal lining is forcing us into a lot of these, what I would consider, this is just me personally, extreme nutritional outlines. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and, the, and the, same, the same applies for, because what's really coming into the fall also is a carnivore, a carnivore based outline. Yeah. Okay? yeah. So you've got this heavy sort of like vegan, plant based, and then also there's a, there's a strong movement for the carnivore uh, sort I've of seen movement. That. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. 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 And, and just to understand that for me, it's really the, the failings of the gastrointestinal lining that are starting to force us into what we perceive as intuition, but it's huh. really the failings within the gastrointestinal lining that just means we feel better in that particular regime. Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay, yeah, so wow. if, I, if, I give you, if I give you an example, like so I, I've, I've actually constructed a, you know, a plant-based vegetarian vegan ebook Okay, because whilst yes, I'm I may be a you know a bit more of an animal protein sort of uh, advocate. Okay, once again, it, it also depends on the individual matter for me. Yeah, yeah. Of okay, um, but you know, I also want if if people you know for ethical reasons or for whatever reasons that they're choosing to to be more plant based, I want to make sure that they're supporting it accordingly. Okay. Because once again, you need to take into account like people are just going into these things blindly. Does that yeah. make sense? Okay, and yeah, they're just yeah. going, "Well, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just make that conversion." Okay, well, just understand you need to, you need to understand. Does it really suit you in this particular moment and time? Does it suit you very well, even based on things like, you know, ancestrally epigenetics, all these types of things? Because you may not actually be that suited towards a heavy plant-based or vegan-based outline. But yeah. I'm not disputing that some people can do very well on that. Likewise, yeah. I do think there's, a, there's, there's a, a segment of the population that do very well and a very dominant uh, uh, animal protein and animal fat-based nutritional outline. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, but yeah, I, also do think, I also do think a, a relatively high proportion of the population are more omnivore-based. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, and so if you, you if you look at it like I was talking about, you need to make sure that you can make particular conversions. And I, I just talked about one, like vitamin A. Okay, yeah. well, vitamin A is the building blocks for your stem cells. Okay, vitamin like vitamin A also helps to mitigate excess amounts of omega sixes like arachidonic acid. High amounts of arachidonic acid can impede on DAO, diamine oxidase. Now it impedes on diamine oxidase. Diamond oxidase is an enzyme you produce to mitigate excess amounts of histamine. Too much histamine causes more epithelial permeability, more things like intestinal permeability and hyperpermeability. Okay, so you know vitamin A is just it's just such a key, uh, key, a key fat soluble vitamin. Okay, yeah. now in the in the plant based realms, okay, what they uh, what they can say is go well, I don't need vitamin A. 
because I can get better carotene. So better carotene is a carotenoid. Okay, it's a phytonutrient. So you get it out of orange colored fruits and vegetables. Okay, now 45% of the population carry a particular genotype. It's called the BCM01 gene. Okay, now the, the, the thing is they don't make the conversion of better carotene into vitamin A. Yeah, right. Okay. Now, if they're, so if they're eating all these orange colored fruits and vegetables, okay, and they're not able to convert, so they're just thinking, well, I'm getting enough vitamin A because of the better carotene. You'll get the benefits of the better carotene because the better carotene has uh, massive anti inflammatory benefits. It actually helps to mitigate excess amounts of interleukin 6, which is like a pro inflammatory protein. So I'm not disputing the benefits there, but they're not making the conversion of the better carotene to the vitamin A. Yeah. So then, my issue there, Maju, is they've gone into this nutritional hour and go, well, I'm getting all the nutrient support that I, that I need. And I go, well, no, not if you sit in that 45% bracket. Yeah. Yeah, okay? And, and not everyone, you know, essentially, if you look at even things like omega-3s. So, yes, I can get like fucoxanthins, which you get out of things like seaweeds, like, like brown seaweeds, um, you know, things like wakame and so forth. Yeah, okay? Well, they go, well, I can... Uh, take the fucoxanthin and then convert that into omega-3 fatty acids like DHA, okay? But once again, if, you know, some people have like uh, convert, like conversion issues, conversion issues in the, in the, in the lip, like they've got liver function issues and all these types of things, yeah, okay? Then that's going to affect their ability to, to make um, efficient conversions. Does yeah. that make sense, okay? It's just, it's, it's just not as... Um, it's just not as straightforward as everyone thinks. Yeah. And so Does that, that makes sense. And yeah. So that's the middle of the waterfall there, right? That you're talking about that, that ability. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and, and so what, what I'm, what I'm highlighting to people is like, so if you fit in that bracket, okay, you're going to need some, some nutritional support, even if you still want to maintain a plant-based outline. So yeah. I'm not against people doing that, but you're going to need some micronutrient support, accordingly to actually help with uh where some of those deficiencies might lie yeah okay and then you yeah. know they might say in the in the plant base they go well i can get things like b12 from nutritional yeast okay well nutritional yeast comes from saccharomyces cerevisiae yeah okay now saccharomyces cerevisiae is like baker's yeast and once again i'm not anti someone using nutritional yeast now and then but if you're trying to get your b12 you know, on a regular basis where you're taking this regularly, what you're throwing off now is your microbiome balance. Okay. Yeah, right, and yeah. high amount yeah. of sac sacrifices cerevisiae can actually give you very similar symptoms to things like candida and yeast overgrowth, where you get things like brain fog, neurological problems. Okay. Because yeah. you're not, you're not meant to be taking, you're not meant to be taking, especially like, a, you know, a particular probiotic, pro probiotic strains or particular, you know, yeast, and then just taking that every single day where you're tipping the scales of the microbiome balance too much in favor of a particular uh, yeast or particular uh, uh, bacterial strain. Yeah. Uh, likewise, you know, like when people take probiotics, okay, and they, you know, they might take Inner Health Plus, and then a lot of like probiotics are really dominant in things like Lactobacillus acidophilus. Okay. Yeah. Now, acidophilus is good. It helps against yeast and candida and vaginal thrush and uh, you know thrush in the throat and all these types of things. Yeah, okay. But if you if you have this on a regular basis, you understand there's like 190 different strains of lactobacillus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not you're not, you're not getting all the the other because there's only I think there's only three in Inner Health Plus. Okay. You're not getting the other 187. Yeah. Okay? And the sort of problem if I'm having too much acidophilus. Too much acidophilus has been linked to things like weight gain and obesity. Yeah, right. You see, yeah. You, see, you see what happens when we're sort of like screwing around with the ratios, okay? And so, you know, I'm not, once again, I'm not anti people going more plant based and vegan, but make sure you're supporting and according to potentially conversions that your body just doesn't, doesn't do potentially because of uh, other complications going on internally in the body, but also maybe ancestral and epigenetic. Uh, reasons as well. Does yeah, that make yeah. sense? But also bear in mind, like, because a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, when I've eaten animal proteins and so forth, okay, it gives me bad breath, you know, I get belching, 
internal belching. Um, you know, I get gut distinction in my stomach. Um, you know, I get nausea. You know, it makes me feel sick. Okay, and I, and I always say, Matthew, I go, yes, okay, I understand that. But just that doesn't mean the animal protein is bad for you, okay, and that you, and that you don't need it, okay? It could actually mean that you've got hydrochloric acid issues. So maybe yeah. you're, 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 you're a chest breather, okay? You don't get enough oxygen, which means you don't get enough carbon dioxide. You don't get enough carbon dioxide, then you don't produce sufficient, amount, sufficient, sufficient amounts of bicarbonate, which means you don't get enough hydrochloric acid, okay? Or um, breathe you more out. Enough, yeah, okay? Or you've got uh, opportunistic bacteria like H. pylori, helicobacter overgrowth. Well, that affects the acidifying effects of hydrochloric acid. So you've got a bacterial overgrowth in your stomach that affects you interacting with the animal protein. And the conclusion the individual has made is intuition. Well, I don't feel good when I eat animal protein, so I, I just don't do well on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when, I, when you've got leaky gut, guess what? You don't do well on sulfur. You don't do well on fructose. You don't do well with alcohol. You don't do well with sugar. You don't do well with so, so like fruits and dried fruits. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You don't do, you don't do well with glidens. You don't do well with gluten. So do I make the conclusion? I, you don't do well with lectins. So you don't do well with nightshades. You don't do well with beans and lentils. So do I make the conclusion? The answer is I just avoid all of those for the rest of my life. Point taken, mate. Yeah, very, very. Uh, <laughs> that 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 um. Hopefully, you know that provides a, a few. Um, a few trigger points for thought because you know yeah yeah and that's that, that's why i'm asking people to, you know like i'm not here as i said i don't believe in a particular nutritional outline for the rest of your life yeah. uh, likewise you, okay yes i'm an animal protein advocate okay but also just understand like people who are sitting in the carnivore realms yeah, okay and then they go well you know look uh, you know i don't get things like bloating and gassiness and i don't get like gurgling in the stomach well if I've got things like autoimmune conditions, if I've got fermentation issues within the gastrointestinal lining, well, what type, what what foods am I going to do really poorly on? So if I've got SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, okay, yeah. well, I'm going to do I'm going to do very poorly on foods that sit there and ferment for a longer period of time. What are those? Carbohydrate molecules, fruit fibers, and vegetable fibers. Yeah. So once again, the conclusion I can make is, oh, but when I eat those things. You know, I get gassiness and I get bloating and I get gut distinction. Also, oh, if I eat more animal proteins, animal fats, you know, okay, because they don't sit there and ferment, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, then I like I feel better eating those things. And they go, well, I've got less inflammation. I feel better. I go, yeah, I, I understand that. Okay. And it's, good, it's, it's a potentially good tool to use. Okay. But you may want to fix the fermentation issues that you've got going on in the gastrointestinal lining. And just to understand going, you know, full carnivore, that's going to alleviate the inflammatory responses, but it's not going to fix the fermentation issues that you've got going on in the gastrointestinal line. The damage is still there. Yeah. Band-aids. Does that make Band-aid sense? solutions. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. mate, what, um, what's the, the best kind of, you know, resource for people to, to start tapping into like you said that you've created a, a, a book an ebook is that like um and the gut repair i know that's something you've put together as well like are these places where people can go to start to like you say just get educated on all this stuff yeah i mean look i'm i'm definitely going pretty heavy into the education space um you know the one thing i'm not great at uh, Maju is like technology. It scares the hell out of me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'm pretty good from the, I guess, the information side of things, but I've definitely been pretty slow on the technology. But look, I have actually developed uh, like a blood software. Uh, the blood software, you actually input the information. Okay. Uh, this is something that I'm actually getting out to coaches and, you know, health experts. Um, you actually input all the uh, the blood markers. And then it actually spits out what the, the, the major problems are for the individual. Wow, so not nice. telling, you know, yeah, not, not telling the, the, the individual that, okay, they've got low hemoglobin, so that means they've got to take iron, which is predominantly the approach that would be used, not just from the medical perspective, but also from the naturopathy perspective. And most of the time, if they applied the, 
you know, iron supplementation or iron infusions because so many people have things like SIBO, negative gram bacteria, just make their problems worse. Yeah. Okay, so it's going away from that approach of this is low, take this to boost it up, or that is high, do this to try and bring it down. Okay, once you actually input the, the blood markers, we actually say, okay, so the, 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 the big problem here is SIBO. Mm. And so what we have to address is it will come out with the maintenance protocol, okay, to actually help the person feel better with the SIBO until they make the decision because we actually have the SIBO protocol in there that they're in a better place to actually go through the healing process and the antimicrobial process of getting rid of the SIBO and healing the gut lining, okay? But it, it will also tell you where the person's energy systems are sitting. So what type yeah. of training is going to do better on? So whether it's more oxidation, long-term system, more aerobic training. So ma maybe they need to, you know, get up in the morning, walk in nature, um, do more steady state, okay? Uh, maybe more things like diaphragmatic breathing, okay? Um, do diaphragmatic breathing. So it would even tell you the lifestyle um, uh, protocols that they need to put in place as well. It will tell you where their neurotransmitter balance is sitting, okay? Um, so how do we I'm get onto that then, mate? <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm actually just started, I just started taking a course. I've got like uh, 14 people on uh, um, sort of my, I guess it's my beta group. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, it's going exceptionally well and the, the feedback I'm getting is phenomenal. And, you know, this is something that I'm definitely going to start to, to, to roll out to, to coaches so they can, you know, really understand, you know, what are the major problems really going on with their, with their clients. And it doesn't mean that they, they're trying to cure diseases or ailments, but they just have a better understanding of what nutrients are going to work better for them, uh, what you know, supplementation that's going to be more multifaceted, that's going to work in many different realms, not this specialization, but also what type of training they can apply that's not going to, to have more detrimental harm on, on their body. Yeah. Okay. And because, you know, I always have the debate with people where they, they basically say, well, you know, trainers should really stay in their lane. And I go, what are you, what are you talking about? Okay. You, like you, you tell me what's negligence. Okay. Is negligence me having someone with an autoimmune disease, okay? Now, potentially what's caused that autoimmune disease is something like intestinal permeability, the bacterial issues, not potentially, it's most likely the cause, yeah, okay? Um, uh, that, that, that's actually caused the autoimmune conditions, okay? And then because people with intestinal permeability have a poor tolerance, they have poor stress resilience, okay? And then I go apply like a training regime that requires you know, like a lot of hypertrophy training, a lot of muscle tissue breakdown, a lot of cellular damage, okay, where this person's enteric nervous system is completely smashed. I smash their central nervous system. The enteric nervous system steps in for the functions of the central nervous system when it's smashed. They just don't have the capacity to do that. So what I've done now is I've applied a training system, okay, which, yes, may be based on good sports science and periodization, but it's actually made their problem worse. Yeah. And that, for me, that is negligence because yeah. I didn't even understand biochemically what is going on internally in the person. Or is it negligence, okay, to, to, to understand the biochemistry, to understand the gastrointestinal problems and go, oh, you know what? Actually, this person's not going to do well on high amounts of hypertrophy training, you know, um, like, uh, like uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, load, a lot of volume, a lot of accumulation, and they're going to do better with things like calisthenics, okay? Like, you know, um, gymnastics and locomotion and primal movements, yeah, okay? And they're going to just do better getting in nature and a lot of blood flow, yeah, okay? A lot yeah. of walking, a lot of active recovery. Maybe it's yoga, more restorative things. And then I'm able to, to see that, okay? And actually, uh, that allows me to understand what type of stress is better to inflict on the on the on the individual and for me that's not negligence yeah. it's negligence not to know that information yeah. does that make sense yeah okay. and then yes like you know i've got the gut repair you know i you know obviously i would prefer to deal with people like individually okay because the you know one thing i want to get across is the gut repair is def it's, it's all aimed around helping with the epithelium the intracellular tight junction so structure within the gut lining okay but it's not going to fix if you've got like parasites, not going to fix if you've got, um, you know, uh, things like SIBO. Okay. Yeah. Um, it will definitely help with things like SIFO and candida and yeast and negative gram bacteria, 
but just understand if you want if if there's more specialized uh, complications taking place, you're going to need a more tailored individual approach. Yeah. Okay. So the Absolutely. gut repair is really really about reducing the inflammatory load and really helping with the structure of the 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 intracellular tight junctions and the epithelium. So structure of the gastrointestinal lining, which is so fundamental to how we function. Okay. Yeah. So there's a night there's a nine week version, there's a 15 week version. I mean, of course, I'm always going to promote people to do the longer version. Why? Because it's going to elicit the best responses. Okay. And within the gut repair, you get the full breakdown. There's a nutritional outline. There's full nutritional support. I tell you in there why I'm giving you those certain things like what I've talked about, why I promote people to have more things like game meat because game meat's high in tyrosine. Okay. The tyrosine is actually the building box that you need for those tight junction proteins like a gluten. There's, there's, there's a method to the madness. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. And yes, I have developed, uh, um, you know, a, a vegan and vegetarian booklet because I'm not against that, but I also want to make sure that people are supporting, su- supporting it properly and not necessarily going into it blindly and taking even things like marine collagen to actually help with the, uh, you know, the epithelium, because obviously they're not necessarily going to get it from, you know, the typical animal collagen. And, mm. um, but once again, there, there is things that we can do to, to actually help with that. Okay. Yes. You know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, a methylcobalamin like B12 support or a sublingual B12, more bioavailable uptake is better. Okay. Um, so just giving them the right support. Does that make sense? So, so I have, constructed a you know vegan and vegetarian ebook okay um so it doesn't mean that vegans and vegetarians can't do something like the gut repair uh the nine week or the 15 week version and the, the other thing that i'm sort of finishing off which has been a long time in the making i sort of got sidetracked there for a while uh is it's my own book and that's that's called untapped uh it's going through its uh final draft nice. um and, and that's it is really um I think it's 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 a bit of a manual uh, for what is really required to achieve optimal health. And within yeah. there, I talk about um, basically some of the fundamental things that we're not really focusing on to achieve that. Yeah. Uh, and then we just keep on overlooking, and that would be things like community. Okay, um, that would be things like you know, for me, gut health is something that we just keep on neglecting. Okay. The, the, the way to understand, like when we look at performance and I'm not taking away from exercise selection and, you know, training protocols and all these types of things, Matthew, okay? But maybe if I, you know, look at your biomechanics and look how you, how you move and then go, okay, so Magic really needs this type of exercise. Look, maybe that exercise selection may increase your, you know, your performance by, uh, who knows, maybe 5% or Maybe it could be more. I think it just completely depends on the individual. But let's look at aspects that we don't look at, okay? So when we look at muscle tissue, um, you know, cartilage, bone, yeah, tendons, ligaments, this connective tissue, okay? Well, the, they've actually tested people with IBD, so irritable bowel disorders, irritable, irritable bowel disease, and IBS, okay? So irritable bowel uh, syndrome, yeah, okay? And that... Basically, would uh, there's all these different forms of IBS, but a lot of the time that's down to things like SIBO. Seventy percent of all IBS symptoms are, are SIBO. Okay, uh, the other thirty percent would be microbiome imbalances and things like intestinal permeability. And there's all these different forms of IBS, like IBS C, constipation based, IBS D, it's diarrhea based, IBS M, which is mixed based. They've got IBS U, which means they don't really know what. Uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag of everything, yeah, okay? Um, but you look at IBD and IBS, yeah, okay? There's a huge proportion of the population that have these types of complications, yeah, okay? Um, and basically, they actually did testing on these people and actually found people with IBD, IBS, okay, that they produce up to 20% less collagen. Yeah, okay? Wow. If, they produce, if they're producing up to 20% less collagen, Okay, sounds like a dog's having a good dog time. Dog's going crazy here, mate. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, if, if they're producing up to twenty percent less collagen, and I need, I need, I need the the collagen to help with the connective tissue and help with my biomechanics and how I function. How, what sort of outcome do you think that's going to have to performance and how I move? It's huge. Yeah. 
okay? And if I actually ha have the ability to repair, okay, uh, you, you know, and rectify the IBD issues and the IBS issues, then you have the ability to increase the performance output by up to 20%. Okay, and so, you know, and so a lot of the time we're just like we we you know we're trying to increase um, optimal output. We might be looking at things like stimulants, like coffee and uh, like caffeine and all these types of things. And I'm and, and you know what I'm really saying in Untapped is a lot of the things that we're just completely neglecting. They're the things that actually have the ability to increase this optimal output by astronomical amounts. Wow. Mate, can't wait to to check that book out. When's the uh have you got a deadline? Like when it's gonna when it's gonna drop? Yeah, look actually I I've you know, like I've got my editor who's is um he's actually based in New Zealand and actually I'm I'm probably the one that's been setting him back. He's like making uh uh good progress and then look I just think with everything, you know, I definitely get got sidetracked. Um, you know, we, you know, like personally, just with the family, we had a pretty um, tough start to the year. And like my partner, uh, Bianca, like unfortunately, uh, her father, he passed away during the year. Okay, oh, sorry. Um, and we made the decision to to actually care for him. Okay, um, and to look after him, which you know, you know, Bianca was just amazing. Like, just have more and more love and more and more respect for her like every single day because she was pregnant looking after a little baby girl and also looking after her dad at the same time whilst there was a lot of chaos from a business perspective taking place as well so wow. um so a lot of those things unfortunately mate uh and for good reason were were, were pushed to one side um but Absolutely. now you know def definitely uh making uh you know, more inroads into it more recently uh, to the to the delight of my uh, editor. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, you know, I'm I'm sorry to hear about the the things that have come about at the start of the year. Um, I just hope that yeah, I mean, you've been able to tap into that community that you've created and um, and been able to gain strength from all of them as, as well as the, the strength that you guys have together because I've met yourself and Bianca and we talk about a duo and um, now you've got like Breya and so you're expecting another child now as well? Yeah, we um, we actually found we're having a little boy so we feel nice. Uh, we feel really blessed um, and, you know, one of each, it's something we, we, we wanted. Look, if, if we had two girls, that would have been amazing as well. But to, to be blessed with one of each and um, it, was qu it was quite an emotional time for me because, um, look, I don't know if you knew this, Majul, but my, my best friend passed away two months before I opened Fifth Element and he was one of the most important people in my life. Um, and so where his middle name was Harlan um, and so we're actually naming uh, our little boy after uh, my best mate, his middle name. So it's uh, it's, it's definitely really special. Um, and as I said, even with the with the stuff with um, you know Bianca's um, Bianca's dad, yes, it was quite traumatic, and you know um, it was extremely hard. But we also feel extremely blessed that um, he was able to stay the whole time with us uh, until the the moment that he took his last breath. Um, and you know. Um, yeah, we, 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 you know, we, if you ask both of us and you especially ask Bianca, she said, she said yes, there was, it was really tough and uh, we can focus on uh, the bad aspects of it, but also for her it was one of the most, um, you know, um, special moments for her to be able to be there when her dad took his last breath. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, there's a lot of pain there as well, mate, but there's, there's also, we feel extremely blessed and, and, um, uh, and uh, to to for that to have uh, uh, been the case the whole way through, and and he was able to stay with us as he wanted to yeah. um, the whole time. So we couldn't we couldn't ask for anything more, man. Yeah, yeah, that's that's incredible, mate. And for you to take that on and to be so, um, you know, like you're saying, like 
peop, older people in our society get moved out out of our periphery and get you know moved on so we don't have to deal with that pain in many ways you know they they get Correct. hand hand yeah. passed on to someone who you know who who may have the the kind of capacity to deal with them in a nursing home or something but like you know for you to to st- for you both to stop and to make that decision and and stare it in the face it's really looking at at life and 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 taking it on mate that is that's incredible that really is something that that needs to be applauded and um you know and just good on you for having the 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 capacity to do it yeah one thing i uh, i said Majo, is we come into the world and there's definitely I would say there's a decent amount of pain there. It can be quite traumatic and it can be an overwhelming experience, yeah, um, and a mixed bag of emotions. But ultimately, we're surrounded by the people that love us the most. Um, and I think we're meant to exit the world in the exact same manner. Uh, and, and it comes with a lot of, there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of uh, hardship there. Um, it's not easy. But ultimately, it's the best thing for the person who's about to exit the world. They, they wouldn't want anything else other than being surrounded by the people that they love. Yeah. And I would, I, would, I, would, I would definitely like to hear if people think that that is not the case. Yeah. Um, and so to, to have that opportunity for Vic, so my father-in-law, um, you know, to be surrounded by his three kids, you, you couldn't ask for anything more. Yeah. Yeah. Ties back into what we were saying at the start of the podcast, mate, like understanding what's really valuable nowadays and what what yeah. really is important. Yeah. Dave, mate, like I said at the start, we could go on for ages. You are a wealth of knowledge and it's and you don't just like you see you're so passionate, mate. You deliver it with with bloody good vibes and um and anyone who's met you in person would say the same thing. So we only touched on surface level of what we could. And um, one day if we get to chat again, I'd like obviously we will in person, but if we get to do it on the podcast, that would be great. Um, up until then, I'll definitely um, make sure I share the work that you guys have been doing. And I, I, I've definitely been appreciating your, um, your time in front of the camera with uh, a couple of the vault videos that have been put out by fifth element wellness over this time so good on you for to stepping up to the plate on that one mate but um uh just want to thank you for the time and thank you and and your team for everything that they do out there yourself and matt and and everyone that works with you um mate you're a just a very very good example of a of how to be a very very good human and uh we need more of you, mate. So um, thank you. Oh, look, uh, thank you, Majul. Like the, the same applies to you, mate. Um, you know, amazing human, like big heart. Um, just keep on doing what you're doing. And like, I, like you know, I always say to people when I'm on a podca- podcast, it's like my honour to be, to be talking to, to you, yeah. Um, so like I really mean that. Like any time someone tells me that they want to, sit down and talk talk to me for you know a couple of hours i mean that the 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 honor is always mine for sure yeah yeah well i'll tell you what mate we only like i said we only went for a small portion of what we could have but um it's uh no less appreciated so um until next time mate thanks again and uh all the best let's get that book out there and um all the best (laughs) (laughs) okay major Great to speak to you, mate, yeah? Yeah, thank you, mate. Bye. So there you have it, guys. That was a a bit of uh, an educational insight into the the world of Fifth Element Wellness and Dave O'Brien. I really hope you can take something from it. There is a lot in there, and uh, I really hope there's something in there that speaks to you. So again, thanks a lot for joining us. We really appreciate it. Please reach out to us at Stokely Podcast. And uh, yeah, until next time, please keep well, look after yourself. Health is very important and it all starts from the inside. Thanks again to Dave for helping contribute to the health of everyone in the in the world with your knowledge and your um, willingness to share it. So much appreciated. 
Until next time, everyone. Bye for now.